Welcome to In the Hot Seat with the Tenney Group. I'm Spencer Tenney. It's good to be with you. Today we have an exceptional guest. We have David Zickler from Brown Brothers and Harriman. David, good to be with you. Hey, Spencer. Good to be with you. Very excited about our discussion. But before we jump in here and heat things up, why don't you tell us uh, a little bit about the work that you're doing at your company, and, um, and we'll just start from there. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, it's, first, it's great to be on, and I appreciate the uh, the opportunity to be on and and chat with you today. So BBH is uh, is not as well known as many firms, but we've been around for 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 a long time. We're a, a two hundred plus year old private bank uh, based out of New York, and um, we're we're still a private partnership uh, today. We are you know owned and operated by thirty two uh, general partners that are all within the firm. And within the private bank line of business where I sit, um, we predominantly serve families and business owners through um, through through three different functions, uh, wealth management, lending, and private equity. And so we have two private equity funds uh, that we invest out of. We have um, a great private wealth management platform, and we also offer offer corporate loans. And then my group, uh, our corporate advisory team really provides support kind of, you know, what, what, what we like to call strategic and thoughtful, uh, objective advice, um, to business owners. And so my background as a investment banker and corporate banker is really used to support our other lines of business like lending and private equity and wealth management. Well, I think this will be really interesting to see kind of this intersection, between transportation logistics, investment banking, and then private wealth management. I'm really excited to see what comes from this conversation. So with that, let's jump right in. So families, um, you mentioned in terms of that being a core part of the business, what are some of the, the, the challenging things about servicing the needs of families well when it comes to private wealth management? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I, I think from, from coming from a background where I work primarily with public companies and private equity owned businesses. You know, the, the economic impact was, was number one on everybody's priority list. And, and, you know, working with families, there's, you know, there's a lot of other, um, there's a lot of other issues at play. There's, you know, how folks interact, who's going to work in the business, who's not going to work in the business. Uh, and then when it comes time for money, it's, you know, how do you tell, you know, the next generation, how much money you have and how you're going to use it and how you're going to steward it. Um, and so BBH kind of, you know, we take a very high level view um, and our objective in working with families and business owners is to try to help them achieve w- whatever their definition of, of success is. But we really like it because we think that, and what I've really seen is that the financial services industry has gone towards serving public businesses and private equity businesses and and rightfully so there's a lot of activity there um but i think there's that's created a hole in terms of serving the needs of a family business that has you know wealth and family and philanthropy on one side but then they still have to operate a business on the other side and so that's the need we try to fill so let's just kind of unpack that a little bit um, in the context of what this phenomenon that we're seeing. We're going to see the greatest transfer of wealth over the next 10 years in the history of mankind. So when you start talking about succession planning um, and preparing families to do that, what, what, how does preparing for a business sale also help family uh, families prepare for succession planning? Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, when it comes to su- succession planning, there's not, you know, that that phrase gets thrown around a lot, but there's many, many pieces of that puzzle. It has to do with the business. It has to do with how you're invested, tax and estate planning. You know, there's not a one size fits all plan for succession planning. And what we like to tell people is to get to get various perspectives and really challenge yourself to figure out what really is your definition of of success. And so, um, you, you know, lots of business owners believe that if they were to sell their business, you know, there might be one particular outcome that they're forced into and they don't want that. Um, but just recently we were working with a family who was thinking about selling their business and we were looking at interested parties and some interested parties said they wanted to, you know, they would want to come in and make a lot of changes and integrate it with one of their existing investments. And 
uh, owned the business 100 percent and another business said, you know, we'd be OK taking a minority position and 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 helping on the in, in a strategic way over the long term and having, you know, opportunities to buy you out over time. Um, and so, you, you know, what I would what, what I like to talk to business owners about when it comes time time to succession planning is kind of opening up, you know, their mind to the art of the possible. And I think what's really important for business owners who have gotten used to having a significant amount of their wealth tied up in a fixed asset like a business is that you really have, we like to visualize it in a triangle and you've got control, you've got liquidity, and you've got growth. And you can typically have two of those three things, but you can't have all three. And so lots of times succession planning revolves around giving up control to get liquidity and growth. Um, but it doesn't necessarily have to, um, you, you know, it could be about taking more liquidity out of a business, um, to aid in the next phase of your life and transferring shares of the business to the family. It could also be about giving up a hundred percent of control and giving up and getting a hundred percent liquidity, um, and realizing that the nature of your family's income is going to be coming from, from different sort different sources down the road. No, I think that's great. I think that's going to be an excellent takeaway, um, Post interview, I, I can already see that in a, in a LinkedIn uh, <laughs> post right now. Um, so, so let me just hang out there for a second. Uh, when it comes to um, you know your your prior life, investment banking, and, and then in the role you're right now, you probably have a little, a little bit more perspective of how commonly these kind of work together. But for our audience, how, can you share a little bit about how the roles of the investment banker um, and the wealth advisor? kind of work around, um, you know, how they kind of work together as part of a process for even for a sale? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think it's, those are the, the role of an investment banker and the role of a wealth management professional professional in kind of, when you think about a team of advisors that it takes to get a deal done, um, I, we really see those as two of the, two of the key people in the process, because if, if those two groups are not aligned in, what the outcome needs needs to be. Ultimately, I don't think the outcome can achieve what what the seller wants. And so, I think the investment banker and the wealth management professional has to be aligned in terms of from the wealth management professional seat. Okay, what type of proceeds are we wanting at the end of the sale? What type of life does this seller want to be living? Do they still want to be operating in the business? Do they want to be 100% out, etc.? And then the investment banker has to take those things and use those, you know, to the process, you know, design the process around that, you know, are the objectives of the seller more aligned with a private equity buyer or a strategic buyer? Um, you know, how much of the payment needs to be upfront versus earned out over, over time? Those are all very, very critical things that, you know, a process is never just as simple as what's the valuation. Uh, you know, I think that's, that's so important to hear because there's there's several things that we try to communicate because quite honestly, um, as I'm sure you can appreciate, we kind of operate from the mentality of do no harm. So if, if the market can't satisfy what needs to happen you know, from the broader goals that you just mentioned, then there's not really a compelling reason to go to market unless you know either for health or for some other reason to go. To, to exit. I mean, it would make more sense to reinvest in the business and try to improve um, a future outcome. But I think the sequencing is what's critical for people to take away from this conversation is that you, you typically get with your wealth advisor, you find out what it is that you want, how do you want to live, and then we can strategize to create either a current or future outcome through a sale that allows you to experience that. Yeah, that's exactly right. You know, you, you have a, an interesting vantage point into M&A, specifically within trucking, logistics, transportation. So what are you seeing um, in this very unique environment, specifically as it relates to labor and the labor shortage across a number of different positions, not just drivers, which is the, you know, the biggest headline. But what, how are you seeing short labor, you know, labor shortage affect um, M&A, specific with strategic buyers? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I, you know, you hit the nail on the head with, with, with driver shortages. So I'm a generalist. I cover a range of industries. You guys in the trucking industry have been used to labor shortages for a long time. And it seems like the rest of the country and other industries are just now getting to feel the pain. Um, but I think 
a lot of strategic buyers are viewing this as an opportunity or are potentially viewing M&A as an opportunity to buy labor and buy talent. Um, and we're seeing that in technology. We're seeing that in services businesses. Um, we're seeing it in transportation. And, um, y- you know, strategic buyers are becoming better and better positioned because when they buy a business, any redundancies that they can reduce in those businesses gives them the opportunity to create more leverage out of their existing labor force, um, which I think will continue to benefit them versus so much of a private equity, um, so much of private equities return oftentimes at today's valuations depends on outsized growth. And for labor dependent industries, it's just hard to find the people to do those jobs oftentimes, which I think, you know, continues to put strategics, um, you know, in the driver's seat. Uh, for for a lot of deals and and, and again there's um, I think there's still obviously lots of opportunities for private equity to be the logical buyer um, but for assets that are labor intensive uh, where there's good cultural fit and it makes good strategic sense for a strategic I I, I think the labor shortage nationwide is going to you know be beneficial to to strategic buyers broadly given the increase in overall m a volume and mm. activity yeah. How's that affecting some of the conversations, you know, at the table when you're advising families, um, and not just family, but all all businesses, yeah. about you know protecting their number one asset, which is typically their business. Yeah. Well, one thing we're seeing is there's 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 a lot of there's there's significant amount of capital tied up right now in what I'll call lower middle market M and A, and those M and A firms are all going after the family owned business with a great culture that they can come in and professionalize and increase margin and drive growth from. Um, And so the owners of those businesses, the families that own them for maybe the first time ever are getting significant inbound interest. And so a lot of them are just thinking, you know, okay, with, with multiples this high, with valuations, this frothy is now the time to consider selling. And so oftentimes it's just being able to provide an accurate answer to the question. It might be a third generation business that they've never seriously considered what's the market value of their of their business, but with as frothy as valuations are right now, it's hard not to avoid the question. And, you know, there's a lot of information out in the world, but it's still hard to get good information. And so, you know, our private wealth advice, um, you know, from my seat oftentimes starts at what the family business is worth. And so, you know, helping them identify what the key drivers of enterprise value are, uh, how a buyer would think about their business what a business could honestly be worth in a process and what type of outcome is best for the family is kind of all the things we help folks think about um, at the onset of a conversation. So maybe you could tell us just about a time, maybe maybe even recently, um, you know, I think this happens a lot where you have maybe the next gen that's not quite ready to take their business over. Yeah. They could be a good candidate. They could be a good potential successor, but there's a grooming process that still needs years um, in order for that to be a real option, how do, how do you wrestle um, with the tension with your clients um, in an environment like this when you know they would like to keep the, the the business in the family, but they don't know if the person is ready or even interested in taking on that responsibility? How do you advise those particular clients? Yeah, you know those are some of the familial issues that that pop up in family businesses a lot that. Um, you know, oftentimes are complex and oftentimes haven't been talked about within the family until it comes time to to think about these things. And oftentimes, even if a family member works in the business, they may have seen their parents or grandparents put in more time to the business than they want to. And so maybe they like working in the business, but they don't want to be the owner of the business or the primary operator of it. Um, and so those are key issues you have to uncover right away because any buyer uh, that comes in where a family is going to continue to work in the business after the ownership transfer. They want to they want to know the character of those people involved, um, and there's certainly an opportunity to take chips off the table and have people go their separate ways and do something else. Um, but also in this market, if if you've got family members working in the business and those people are valued employees and and they're doing great work, um, I think buyers oftentimes are more receptive to you know legacy family members staying in the business if they're if they're good people and they want to be in for the right reasons. Uh, we were, we we're just working with a, um, with a business owner, uh, owner of a, a large industrial distri- distribution business. And um, he's got multiple kids that work in the business 
um, but none of which are prepared to take over it today. And so he's battling the question, does he sell or does he bring in professional management or does he continue to stay involved until one of his kids are ready? And those are um, those are difficult questions to answer, but it kind of all comes down to the person. I think that's good color there. I appreciate that. So transitioning to the world and all of the craziness that's going on right now, um, and then M and A. So how could some of these global geopolitical issues that are becoming extremely um, significant um, in history right now? How could that affect the M and A landscape in the coming months? Uh, or years. Yeah, sure. Well, you've got a lot of things. You've got the geopolitical environment, the war in Ukraine. Uh, we've got rising inflation and a Fed that um, that is going to be rising rates or raising rates in a time where the economy might be slowing down. You got rising commodity prices, at least at the time we're that we're having this conversation, and um, those are all things that drive uncertainty and typically lower. Um, you know, the market value of a business. And so that would typically not be good for M&A. Um, but at the same time, you have this massive population of generally what we'll call the baby boomers that are that are running these businesses and getting closer to a retirement age, a next generation that may not want to do the same things that their parents did. Um, and over a trillion dollars of private equity capital sitting on the sidelines. So you've got a lot of forces. I think it's always easy to sound intelligent when you just pull out the bear market facts and think about all the things that could go wrong. But I think there's also a lot to like. I think that um, U.S. manufacturing is on the rebound. I think that what we like to call uh, picks and shovels businesses, you know, businesses that, you know, um, kind of serve other businesses with good tailwinds. uh, There's always going to be a market for those. Um, And, uh, you know, there's just there's so much capital on the sidelines and so many businesses that are getting closer to the stage of changing hands, I think even with some of these geopolitical risks, uh, the M&A market will still remain strong. It just might be a matter of valuations coming back down to more normalized levels than what we've seen the past the past couple of years. I really appreciate you sharing your insights with us. This is extremely valuable to our industry. We hope you'll come back and join us again as uh, things develop in the market. But until then, we'll see you next time.